and why is this so important to you? I don't think that you can learn without being engaged. Um, learning, I feel, is a privilege. It makes my soul sing. Uh, yet, I see uh, students who feel frustration and angst because they don't know where to begin. Mm -hmm. They don't understand the contents or the instructions that they've been given. Yet, many instructors are tasked with teaching on a level that assumes that students have critical thinking skills mm -hmm. and are able to write competently. So we, we can't force students to engage, so what can instructors do? Well, actually, you're right to a certain extent, I think. But I think that, that uh, instructors, instructors can help students engage. Uh, I think that many students don't really understand what the content and the discipline entails. Mm -hmm. So they're not in a position to make a judgment. Mm -hmm. So instructors are in a position, once they know a little bit about their students, of being able to explain to them why their course is so important to students um, for both their professional goals and for their personal goals. So what exactly is student engagement? Uh, instructors often say that student engagement, they see student engagement when students are busy, when they're excited, when they're passionate about something. Mm -hmm. And they also see student engagement when they're working on something, when they want to solve a problem, when there's a challenge and they're actively working on it and they want to want to figure this out somehow. Mm -hmm. So basically I think it's both motivation and it entails active learning. So how do you motivate people? Good question. Not always easy. Pragmatically there are two items. The um, the effort involved and the the consideration of the feeling of whether a student feels they can be successful mm -hmm. in terms of those, those are the two variables involved in whether they'll engage in the outcome, whether they want to get to the outcome. The effort is pretty straightforward. Mm -hmm. If they don't think the effort is worthwhile, they won't engage. Forget it. Um, but it's the, it's the feeling of success, whether they can be successful, that's the more fraught. Um, because it has, it can have multiple um, variables to it. If they feel, if they've been, if they have failed previously, um, whether it's in the discipline, whether it's in test taking, whether it's writing papers, they're less likely to engage. Mm. If they're cognitive dualists, that is they feel the instructor has the right answer mm. and it's the instructor's um, duty to tell them the right answer which they then give back on the test. If that's the case, asking them to engage at a higher level is going to be hard. Mm -hmm. um, also, if they're feeling unprepared or if they've been given a task that's way beyond what they feel they can do right now, they may not want to do it. And finally, if they're a minority or a first gen um, and they don't know how to play the game, mm -hmm. they, that may negatively affect them. So do you have some strategies that you can share? Yeah, actually, let's, let's go a step further. We know from cognitive psychology, which has told us a lot, thankfully, that there are three things that can, that can uh, motivate people. One is a feeling of autonomy, mm -hmm. giving students some choice in how they demonstrate their learning and how they learn. Mm -hmm. um, a feeling of competence, giving them multiple practice opportunities where there's uh, credit involved but no grade involved. So they can build trust and feel that they can be successful and be prepared to perform successfully on summative assessments. Mm -hmm. And the third thing is relatedness feeling that there's support, that they're in this with other people, and that's where informal group activities 
come into play. They're really great in class. No group product, no group graded product, but just working together on a worksheet or on a problem. Mm -hmm. um, and it turns out that less prepared students um, uh, benefit disproportionately to activities like that. They gain more learning than someone who's more prepared, which is a really good thing for right. those who are less prepared. So Jane, can you give me some examples? Sure. Um, in terms of instructors, I would choose an example that fits the level of thinking that you want your students to work on, as well as an activity that you think will fit your discipline. So let's start with knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, for uh, courses in which you have to learn a lot of terminology and remember a lot of facts. Practice quizzes, practice, 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 credit only. Um, so, but give them the opportunity to do that. And you can do that online if you want to. Um, Jeopardy. Have, uh, you can have them play Jeopardy games, but even better, have teams of students create those Jeopardy games and then play them in class. Uh, that, that can work very well. Uh, next thing, application. Directed paraphrase is a long time strategy where you're asking students to take um, sort of an opaque concept and try to put it in their own words and communicate it to a lay audience. Um, the other thing that uh, Chris Ray, who teaches biomechanics, uses, he has students create a Twitter account specific to his course, uh, and then he has a course hashtag, and for every concept that he teaches in class, he wants students to go out and find an example. Mm -hmm. So they may be walking across campus and see an example and write about that. Or they may find something on YouTube. Mm -hmm. Or some of them have even created their own video and posted it to YouTube and then to Twitter. And it's so fun, he's enjoyed that. Then the first five minutes of class, um, he shows some of those examples and explains why they're good examples and uses the students' names, which makes them feel wonderful. Mm -hmm. So then let's look at analysis mm -hmm. and critical thinking. Uh, I would work on, in the beginning, it's amazing how many students don't know how to categorize and they don't know how to compare and contrast. And the first thing, the very first step, is to figure out what these categories are, and they need to do that. So give them these items. You could put them on post-it notes or just give them a list, and then have them group them, and then figure out what common characteristics they have, and only then do they have their categories. And then they can start putting things in. So it's sort of, making it an inverse activity, which can help them better. Compare and contrast, I would give them a table. So they can put Article A says this, Article B says this on the other hand. So they learn to do that. Um, okay, third thing, synthesis um, and creativity. Doing team concept maps, doing role plays, doing multimedia presentations, doing um, one thing that Kelly Rulison has done in her stats class. Stats is so hard for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, and they lose it after they take it. Uh, she has them each create a Google site. It's like a portfolio of their work. And she has them write out in text what something means. And they may even grab a screenshot so they have a graphical view of it and then create an example. And they have this to take away with to use in the rest of their program, which can be very helpful for them. Uh, lastly, solving problems. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something that I can really relate to because I couldn't do word problems. I could do X's and Y's, I could not do word problems. Figuring out not just what is the correct answer to a problem, but what kind of a problem is it? So categorizing problems. Mm -hmm. Um, and the same thing, say, in English with, with fallacies. Okay, what kind of a fallacy is in this argument? Um, so being able to identify those fallacies before you go further with it. Mm -hmm. So those are a few examples. So how could I put this in practice in my classroom tomorrow? 
Well, that's the good part. You can start small. So I would think about the level of thinking you want um, in your class, and then what kind of activity would suit your discipline. And if you're brave, even choose a common misconception. Mm -hmm. And there are great reference books that you can use and flip through and very quickly find an activity that can work for you. Uh, I would talk to the UTLC, they can give you a stack of books, but two that I would recommend for a first take is Elizabeth Barclay's Student Engagement Techniques um, and Linda Nielsen's Self-Regulated Learning. Not only are those activities useful, but they help students learn how to learn and reflect on their learning. Good. It was perfect. It's not a clock. <laughs>